We want to thank uh, those who are here and those who are online. Uh, first time visitors, if you're here and there should be a card in front of you, would fill it out. Uh, most time our pastor will get you a gift, so it's worth filling it out. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We thank you today, Lord, for, for the rain you sent. We thank you, Lord, for the building that you made for us to come and to worship you. We're mindful, Lord, those who are absent from our midst, pray you bring them back. Pray, Lord, you be with Jay, that you lift him up. Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts. Lord, you would change us where we need to be changed, and you would help us where we need to help. And, Lord, we pray for each one that's here. Pray, Lord, that they wouldn't leave this house without knowing that Jesus is Lord of all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
from the pit of my despair. There you were in the shadows, holding out your hand. You met me there, and now where would I be without you? Where would I be, Jesus? You were the voice in the desert, calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story, lifting me up from the ashes, carry my soul from dead to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story, you are your Lord. You are my rescue story. You are, you are. You were writing the pages before I had a name, before I needed grace. Mm -hmm. Singing songs of redemption, because every time I ran away, you were louder than my shame. And now where would I be without you? Where would I be? Oh, Jesus, you were the voice in the desert, calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You were my rescue story, lifting me up from the ashes. Carry my soul from dead to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story. Never gave up on me. Never gave up on me. You are my testimony. Oh. Never gave up on me. Never gave up on me. You are my testimony. Never give up on me. Never give up on me. You are my testimony. Stand with us again and worship with us.
Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you so much for your worship. Don't be ashamed to let the whole world know who you are and whose you are. We need to let everyone know. If I were to ask you today, what, was the, what do you think the most popular parable is that Jesus ever spoke, what would you say? Absolutely, uh, one of the ones that comes to mind for, for most is the Good Samaritan. Uh, Samaritan, is, is, this is one that we're, goes back to the felt board days of Sunday school. This is just one that was always, it was used in vacation Bible school. And uh, so this is a very popular story of the Good Samaritan. We find that in Luke chapter 10. I believe it is one of the most well-known parables of Jesus. If you've never heard the parable, you at least know the name. And I guarantee you've heard the Good Samaritan. You've heard people use that name before. And while this parable is popular, it's not always correctly understood. You see, on the surface, this parable appears to be just a simple story about being kind, but it actually goes much deeper than that. Whenever we hear the term, the Good Samaritan, we immediately, our minds go to, uh, to envision someone who is, while they're driving down the road, spots a wrecked car, pulls over, and rescues the person trapped in the twisted wreckage. Uh, perhaps we might picture the fireman who would rescue a cat that got stuck in the tree. I'm not sure why they would just leave the cat in the tree, but I, we might picture a fireman rescuing a cat that gets stuck in the tree. Uh, certainly you have heard of Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse. And so the name is synonymous with many things. There's at least six hospitals that has uh, used and incorporated the name in, their, in the name for the hospital. And so the Good Samaritan is defined as one ready and generous in helping those in distress. So it's become a an idiom of unusual kindness and extraordinary care for those who are hurting. To refer to someone as a good Samaritan is a great compliment. And if we're honest, many of us are ready and generous to help other people. It's how some have been raised. It's how some are wired to function. But I also recognize how people are sometimes very particular about who they're willing to help. Today, it seems uh, very common for people to help those who are dressed nicely, to help those who are their friends, maybe those who are in high places, those who can possibly repay the favor to them later. Maybe it's trying to impress or, or help someone who you are attracted to of the opposite sex. And so there's a lot of ways that people are willing to help other people, but how willing are we to help someone who smells bad? or is dressed in old clothes, or has disgusting habits? Do people readily help their enemies? Do they jump at the, the chance to help someone with a different skin color or ethnicity from them? Some people will, but there are many others who will not. Listen, the lesson of the Good Samaritan is not only a call to help those in need. It is far too simplistic to say that Jesus' main focus is about showing kindness to strangers. In reality, Jesus told this story to illustrate how far we all fall short of what God's law actually demands of us. Jesus is explaining to us why all of our good works and religious activities are never sufficient to gain favor with God. And he tells this story to a narrow-minded religious legalist who is trying to diminish God's law by a hair-splitting analysis of the word neighbor. 
During his three and a half year ministry, Jesus was met with relentless opposition from key religious leaders. And after he sent out 72 disciples on a final mission to take the gospel to the cities of Galilee, he knew that they were going to be met with opposition when they carried the gospel there. And so this is what we see in Luke 10, verses 10 through 12. It should be on the screen for you, but if you have your Bible in Luke 10, you can look there as well. Jesus says, But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the, de- even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on, the, on that day for Sodom than for that town. And so after Jesus says these words, he condemns three specific towns by some of the harshest words that he ever spoke. Of course, the religious leaders became more angry. If you can imagine them getting more angry with Jesus, they became more irate after he spoke these words. And one expert stepped up to try and embarrass Jesus in the midst of all that. How does that just sound to you? Well, he tries to embarrass Jesus. And this is what he says in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That is the same parallel for Matthew 22 and Mark 12. You you would recognize that. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Watch this. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and when he saw him he had compassion. He went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. You bow with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your inerrant, infallible word. Father, we thank you for these words, even though they may sound familiar to us. God, I pray that you would open up our ears, that they would not become, become callous to just a message about kindness. Father, that you would... Allow your spirit to work in us and reveal to us maybe something that we haven't seen before. Lord, I pray that you would be with each one of us today, that you would help us in our need, God, that you would open up our our spiritual eyes to the needs that are around us. And this may encourage us to to be that need to to help some of the needs around us. But, God, I believe that there are others who are searching. There are others, God, who are seeking out and, and have questions. And so, Father, wherever we are in our walk with you, I pray that you would meet us today. Lord, that you would open up our eyes and our hearts to hear from you. And, Father, that we would be responsive as the Holy Spirit leads. And, God, I ask that you would move me out of the way that this sermon does not come from me. That the words come from you and that you you pierce our hearts to the core. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to a a very familiar uh, parable, and one of the things that jumps out in this this text is verses 25 through 
29, or 20, uh, verses 29 through, through, through 30, 36 there. Um, and so whenever we come across those words, we immediately think the Good Samaritan, we go right to that parable. But there's something that sets the stage prior to this story that Jesus tells. And so I believe that we need to understand how the text is put into context. We need to see why he tells this story of the Good Samaritan. It's not just to teach people how to be kind. Jesus has a reason for doing that. And so as we step through this, I want you to keep that in mind as we go through. So the first thing we're going to look at is how we can put this text in context for us to get to the story. And I believe it begins in verses 25 and 26. But there are two questions that this lawyer Ask Jesus, and it shapes the whole context of this parable. The first one comes in verse 25 there. He says, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Now Luke tells us this in the same verse, in verse 25, he points out to us that this man's insincerity with this question. This was not an honest question from someone who was genuinely seeking a response. It, it was a test. It was a, it was a challenge, if you will. He was trying to, to trap Jesus in a moral dilemma that he believed had no answer. And so the lawyer was just trying to impress the masses with his, with his theological prowess. And he was hoping that he could just trip Jesus up enough that the people would quit listening to him. But here's the thing. His first question that he asked is not a bad question even though he had evil intentions behind the question. It was a question that was asked often in Scripture when, when people approach Jesus themselves. I'm immediately reminded of Nicodemus in John chapter 3, but also in, in Matthew chapter 19, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. They both ask the very similar questions. But do you see the contradiction in his questions? He's asking what he must do in order to inherit eternal life. See, most, most Jews had been taught by their rabbis that their lineage, their, their circumcision, their, their traditions, that was what qualified them for the eternal kingdom. And the hard truth is many sitting in church pews today believe the exact same thing. It's their parents, their grandparents. They walk down an aisle. They, they said a prayer. They, maybe they were baptized. Maybe it's the fact that they've been present in the church for 50 years. It's all those things. They're not necessarily bad on the outside. They're blessings from God for many of them. But, but it's all those things that you do is what gains you access into eternity. But an inheritance is not something that we work for. It is a gift. And as Jesus often did, he turned the question back on the person who asked it. The guy wasn't expecting that. In verse 26, Jesus says, what's written in the law? How do you read it? Now I want you to notice there that Jesus takes him back to the authority of the Bible. Folks, whenever someone comes to you with an agenda, you know that their heart's not sincere. They're coming to you. They want to poke holes in your faith. They want to poke holes in your theology. They want to poke holes in your beliefs. And you know that they're not coming at you with a sincere question. It's easy for you to go back and say, well, what, do you, what does the Bible say to you? How do you read it? Don't forget that. Take them back and you can find out where their heart is for sure. But this lawyer, he replies with a very polished response from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. It was a perfect summary of the law's moral demands. He nailed it. As a matter of fact, it would have been on his, on his cheat codes, under his, under his sleeve right there. He had it on his play band, his, his phylactery that they carried around with him. He had this memorized from age 12. He knew that. He was prepared for that. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And if we do those two things perfectly, we will not need any other rules. Jesus acknowledged his answer. He said, you're right. You're correct. But at the same time, he flips the tables as only Jesus can. And he shows him that he's the authoritative expert. And then Jesus adds these unsettling words to that. Do this and you will live. 
So is Jesus all of a sudden uh, advocating a works-based theology? No. Oh, it's much deeper than that. He's saying that if you want to use the law as leverage to get into heaven, that you better follow everything in it by always loving God every second, every hour, every day, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, from the day you were born to the day you die. The phrase, do this, means keep on doing this forever. That word love, love your neighbor, is in the present tense, meaning constantly and continuously. That also includes loving your neighbor perfectly. All the time. That's the standard that God set. If you want to get in, you got to be perfect. One slip up, and you're out. This legal beagle is, is condemned by the very law that he quotes. Folks, the purpose of the law is to show us that we can't keep it. As a matter of fact, Romans 3 verse 20 tells us this, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Jesus is really holding a mirror up to this legal expert to prove to him how far he had really fallen. Now I've, showed you, I, I, I've told you this before, but a mirror can't fix you. We look in them every day. The mirror can't fix you. It simply tells you what needs fixing. And so his next response should have been, you know what, Jesus, I know that I can't fulfill even the basic commandments of the law, so where can I find redemption? That should have been his next response, but it wasn't. In verse 29, he asked the second question that helps put this text in the context. Who is my neighbor? Do you notice how he conveniently skips over the part about loving God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength? This guy is feeling the squeeze, I guess, so to speak, of the, of the commandment, so he seeks to defend himself and to deflect his responsibility by asking for a definition of the word neighbor. See, there was a raging debate then, and I believe that same debate is today. Who is my neighbor? Who is, who is in my circle that I could define as my neighbor? They wanted to know, in that day, they wanted to know who was in and who was out. The Jews typically interpreted neighbor as one who is near a fellow Jew. Someone like them. The Pharisees tended to reject ordinary people who couldn't measure up to their elite standards. Someone like them. And so this man wants Jesus to, to draw a circle, but it's not, the circle is a lot bigger than he bargained for. And so the lawyer wanted a legal limit by making the law require less than it actually does. People do this all the time. Some rely on being a good person in order to get into heaven. Others know that they're not that good, and so they try to reduce God's entrance requirements. God's perfect, and so He understands when I mess up. He understands that. He's good. Everything's good. He understands that I mess up. Some re rely on their traditions, as I've already said, to be able to gain access into heaven. Does any of those describe you? Do you really think you're good enough to get in? Or do you think that you can, can justify yourself by lowering God's standards to make you look better? Jesus doesn't directly answer the question. He doesn't quote the Greek. He doesn't, he doesn't present a, a, a lengthy dissertation to him. Instead of arguing in the abstract, he just presents a concrete case. Jesus could have blasted this stubborn, self-righteous man. But instead, he gave him one more chance to see his own sinfulness. This is designed 
to show each of us how sinful and how selfish we really are. And that our only hope of getting into heaven is by being justified by Jesus, not by doing any kind of good works. Keep in mind the text that sets up the story. Don't forget the characters that are involved here and what's being said. I know whenever it comes to a, a story that we've heard many times, we get used to a certain way that that story is presented. And I don't want to bore you with that this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word in front of you, if you don't trust me, then you can follow along with me. But for just this morning, I want you to look at this from a different perspective, a different angle than maybe you're typically accustomed to looking at this story. What if we were told this story through swollen eyes? What if the story that we hear is coming from the one who had been beaten? Put your imagination cap on with me. This is what I believe he would say if he were asked. I just left Jerusalem. And I was on my way home to Jericho. It was a 17-mile trip. I loved my time of worship that I was there in the temple, but I was eager to see my family again. I should go ahead and tell you that, that it is the road drops 4,000 feet in elevation across this 17-mile span. There was huge boulders and, and caves where robbers would hide out. We often refer to it as the bloody pass because so many who passed this way got beat up and they got robbed. It was not a good idea to ever travel this road alone. I knew many stories, but I didn't have a choice. As I rounded a sharp bend in the road, a man jumped off of a, of a rock and he landed on my back. Another one took me out at the knees. And a third one grabbed my head and he started slamming it into the stony pass. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. They took all of my money, and then they ripped all the clothes off of my back. As they started to leave, the bigger guy kicked me in the face, and I felt excruciating pain as several of my teeth hit the dirt. As I curled up to protect myself, another one slugged me several times in the stomach with a stick, and I started vomiting. I don't know how long I had laid there because I slipped in and out of consciousness several times. Then I heard a noise and I heard some voices coming and I thought, oh no, the robbers are coming back. They're going to finish me. I had trouble focusing through my swollen eyes, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really see what was coming and I noticed that it was a priest as he got closer. The same priest that was at the temple. And I thought for sure that he would help me, and so I put my hand up because I know that he saw me, and as soon as I put my hand up and as soon as he looked at me, he looked away and he hurried around the bend, around the corner, never to be seen again. Several minutes passed and a Levite came by, the same one who was assisting the priest at the temple. He slowed down and, and he looked at me. He walked over and looked at me and I, I looked at him but I couldn't speak. I was sure that this religious man would help me. But as he looked at me he seemed bothered. He seemed grossed out by all the injuries and all the, all the, all the hurt that had, been, had been come to me, all the wounds and, and everything that he saw. And so he quickly turned and he ran away. With darkness approaching, I just figured this was it. I was going to die right here. I was never going to see my family again. And I began to shut my eyes, and then I caught an image of a man on a donkey. I could tell by the way he was dressed that he was a Samaritan. Our family hated Samaritans. And the sentiment went both ways. The animosity went back generations when, when his ancestors intermarried with pagans. 
My forefathers burned the temple of the Samaritans to the ground and they responded by sneaking into our temple and defiling it. The only reason that I traveled this long road was because I didn't have to go through Samaria and risk encountering one of them. And so I covered my face so he at least couldn't spit in my eyes. But what happened wasn't what I expected. He climbed off his donkey, he came over to me, and I saw compassion in his eyes. He took his wine, which we used as an antiseptic, and he poured it over all of my wounds. And then he rubbed a very expensive soothing oil on my sores. He then tore pieces of his own clothes off and used them as bandages for my wounds. Once he had all the bleeding stopped, he picked me up and he placed me on his donkey. I guess we walked for several miles until we got to the inn. And he stayed up with me all night, bringing me water and trying to get me to eat. The next day, he took out two, uh, two days' worth of wages, and he gave them to the innkeeper and urged him to look after me until he could return. That was enough money for about a month's worth of food and lodging. He even told the manager to keep an open line of credit and he would cover any additional charges when he came back. What are you thinking right now? Have you thought about it through the eyes of the beaten man? Sometimes we become so familiar with a story we forget what's taking place in the story. I urge you not to do that. Keep in mind the context that we're talking about because in verses 36 and 37, we find a twist of epic proportion. If I'm honest, whatever trap this lawyer is planning for Jesus was squashed out by this parable. Jesus' words prove that racism, social class, political affiliation, or just bad life choices is never an option for refusing to help someone in need. Especially for someone who calls themselves a Christian. Now we're not talking about enabling. We're, not, we're talking about someone who, generally, who genuinely needs help and is wanting to seek help they deserve help, and we should reach out and help. So there's a difference here. That's, we're not talking about just, just continuing to enable someone who won't, doesn't want any help. Church, be careful about allowing religiosity to become an excuse for excluding those that you don't like. The ironic thing is that the, the priests were to serve as public health officials. And part of what the, the Levites did was to distribute funds to the poor and the needy. Listen, the religious people in this story didn't apply what they knew. They spent all their time worshiping and praising, but didn't work it out practically. They came from God's presence, but somehow God's presence never got through to them. We can sing praise to the Lord and great is our God in worship and then we can leave and we can walk right by injured people who are made in the image of God. In the end, Jesus turns this lawyer's question right back on him. In verse 36, he says, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Well, the expert only had one response and he couldn't even bring himself to say, Samaritan. And then Jesus dropped the hammer. You go and do likewise. This wasn't a one-time action. This was a lifestyle of loving servanthood. And here's the deal. The lawyer knew the law demanded that you love like this all the time. So if anything, this, this final command from Jesus should have invoked a plea of grace and forgiveness. Did it? We don't know. It ends there. 
The story ends there, so we don't know. But let me show you the part of the story that often gets missed. Keep in mind, this is where Jesus turns the lawyer's question on its head. And if you recall from the beginning, the conversation started with what a person must do to inherit eternal life. And of course, if you know anything about the life and teaching of Jesus, you know the whole point of His coming was that he could, we could not save ourselves. And so He came to save us, which is where the twist of epic proportions starts. I'm not taking this out of context. I want you to think. Let me ask you, why have a Samaritan be the hero? Why not tell the story in a way where the lawyer can identify with the person who he offered to help? Why not say the priest came by, then the Levite, then a, a really good loving Jew came by? Be like the loving Jew. I believe Jesus had a specific reason for using a character who could not have been more different from the guy asking the question. And here's why. What if the person that we and the lawyer are supposed to identify with in this story is not the priest, not the Levite, not the Samaritan? What if instead we were primarily like the guy bleeding on the side of the road? And what if someone who had every reason to hate us and to be our enemy, someone very unlike us, chose to put himself into danger to help us? What if the good Samaritan is Jesus? Who put himself into the path of danger. He took upon himself the suffering that we had caused ourselves. And he poured out his own resources to save us. I believe Jesus is asking this man, what if you were bleeding to death on the side of the road and your only hope was an act of free grace from an enemy that you don't owe anything? If you had been rescued like that, what would your life look like? I'll tell you, it would be different. It would be fundamentally and eternally different. You see, Jesus is not giving the lawyer a new rule as much as he is making him aware of a new reality. Folks, we are the ones saved by radical grace from a God who had every right to regard himself our enemy. And when we embrace that truth, we too will become givers of radical grace. In verse 33, Jesus uses a Greek word for compassion, splagma. I like that word. Just say it. Go ahead. I know that you want to. Just say it. Splagma. You, you, you can't say it without splagma. I mean, you have, to, you have to get into it. You, have to, you can't say it just splagma. You can't do that. That word doesn't come out that way. But let me tell you what that means. It means pity from your deepest soul your gut. And so Jesus is talking less about an action that you choose and more about an emotion that you can't control. Listen, God is not after rule followers. He wants people who love like He loves, who responds like He responds. And this kind of change can't be produced by the law. It can only be produced by a radical experience of grace. How can an individual experience that kind of grace from the great Samaritan and not become filled with grace? Now, I submit to you that those who have truly experienced the gospel for themselves develop an uncontrollable impulse to be generous and insane ability to forgive. And here's the deal. We don't, we don't love our neighbors in order to earn eternal life but because splagma has taken over and it's shown through us. 1 John 4, 19. 
It says we love because he first loved us. Our capacity to love is reflected in that. So what's the takeaway? A cool story from Swollen Eyes. Completely flipped the parable on its head that you probably haven't thought of because I saw that in my study and I said, I've got to share this. It's okay if you feel motivated to step up your love efforts for your neighbors in this parable. It's okay. But if that's the only response that you get from this parable, that it's practically the worst response that anyone could have to the lesson that Jesus was teaching. You see, this parable is intended to, to lead us to confess our sinful weaknesses and to repent of our lack of compassion and sacrificial love to others. And to realize that, that Jesus alone is the only true source for eternal life. Not our religious works. Maybe you're here and you're still lying by the road. Maybe you're still wounded. Maybe you're still bleeding. Maybe you, maybe you feel forgotten. Maybe you feel abandoned. Maybe you feel hopeless. Maybe you feel helpless. Jesus came to help you. Will you not give him your heart today? If you're struggling with that today, will you not just submit and surrender yourself to him and just give him your life? Let me tell you something. You can try everything that you want to to try to fix stuff on your own. You're going to fail. If anything, you're going to make it worse. Give it to God. Let Jesus have that place in your life. He's the only one that can fix it. Are you willing to trust him with your attitude, with your circumstances? Are you willing to trust him with your family today? Every one of us can relate to, this, to, the, to the wounded man because we've all been there. Sin has so destroyed our lives in different ways. And so we all fall guilty of it. We need a Samaritan. We need Jesus. Are you willing to surrender your life to him today? If everyone would, please bow your head, close your eyes. Nobody looking around. You know that I don't typically do this, but I feel led to do it today. So if you, if you, are, if you are here and you're in our presence today, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That if you died today, you don't know for sure if you would go to heaven. Are you willing to slip your hand up and say, Jay, that's me. I don't know. I don't know for sure that I would go to heaven if I died today. Anyone. Maybe you're here and you realize that you do have a relationship with Jesus, but you haven't put him first. You haven't made him a priority in your life. You've let other, th other things take over that priority. You've let the world squash out that love and that joy that only he can provide. And maybe today you come and you want to rededicate your heart and your life to God. Give him what you've stolen or what the enemy has stolen for years. If you come this morning and you say, look, I, Jay, I know that I'm a Christian. I know that I'll go to heaven, but I have, if I'm honest, I haven't lived my life the way that I should live. Are you willing to be honest with God? You, you slip your hand up right now and just say that I'm, I haven't lived the way that I need to live. Thank you. See those hands. God sees those hands. And so I want to encourage you. you can, these altars are open. I would love to pray with you no matter what it is. Maybe you need to come and you need to ask God to help you go to someone. Maybe it's someone that you know that you need to help and you've neglected doing it. But today you know that you need to go out of here and make that right and do it. I want to encourage you to, to let God give you the words and the direction. Again, the altars are open. I don't know how the Holy Spirit is leading, but let me pray and then, we will, then we'll have our invitation. Father God, I thank you that you love us. I thank you, God, for salvation through Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the love that was shown towards us, even when we didn't deserve it, even when Scripture tells us that we were your enemies. Jesus came and he died for us anyway. God, we can't repay that. So, Father, help us to live for you. 
And I pray for those who are bold enough to say that I'm not where I need to be, but I want to fix that. God, that you would give them the courage to step out and do that. To make those changes in their life today. To put you first in everything they say and everything they do. So that they can impact the many people they come in contact with. And God, maybe there's someone here who, who wasn't comfortable raising their hands to say, I'm not sure about my salvation. Father, don't let them leave if they're being convicted by the Holy Spirit. I pray that they would have courage to step out and boldly come and profess you and confess you today. God, we're going to ask that you would move in our midst. And Father, help us to be sensitive to how the Holy Spirit leads. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You please stand. Jesus Christ.